Hey everyone, if you want to make your own podcast but you don't know where to begin, Spotify for Podcasters makes it super easy. They've got everything in one place, it's totally free, and you can make money while doing it. Here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start doing it today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and pretty much everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also supported, and you can even conduct polls and Q&As. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, the platform is totally free. No catch, totally free. When I wanted to start my own podcast, I did not know where to begin, and I didn't think it was even possible. And Spotify for Podcasters made it happen. They made it easy. They made it quick. And I am doing something that I love. What more can I ask for? So if you're interested in starting your own show, you can do it. And I highly recommend you give this a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hey, everybody. What's up? Welcome back to another episode of Everything Kratom, the podcast about anything. And everything. Great. Um, great to have you with us on this Thursday morning. Hoping all's well with you out there today as always. I'm doing pretty well. Bit tired, but I'm chugging along. So today I wanted to talk about a really important factual error about Kratom that I am seeing everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean in government websites, in state websites, in websites of organizations that are friendly to Kratom, and in existing Kratom Consumer Protection Act language that is either proposed or enacted in current law in different states. This is something that I am kind of realizing after the episode that I did yesterday, which if you didn't listen to it, you should check it out. Um, There's going to be a bit of context there for what I'm about to be talking about today. But if you don't want to check it out, essentially what I talked about was that there was this presentation recently given by uh, Dr. McCurdy, who is at the University of Florida, and he does a lot of really interesting Kratom research. So already interesting guy, right? Well, he was presenting to this, basically this uh, organization that has been tasked with research and development for uh, the country of Indonesia. And so he gave this presentation. It's on YouTube. Link is in the description. And one of the findings that he was showing, which I, this is something I had no idea about. And then this is going to lead into what I want to talk about today. One of the findings in that research was that 7-hydroxy mitragynine, which is, you know, as everyone says and knows, who's into Kratom, the second most prevalent alkaloid in Kratom, you know, or either second or third, depending, that is not naturally occurring in Kratom leaves that are like, you know, growing. He found out from testing all of these different Kratom products, doing analysis on plants, live plants too, he has found that 7-hydroxymitragynine is not present in kratom leaves up until even the point when you pick them. And then in most cases, if not all, I I don't believe he mentioned he found any in this case, um, when you even are getting kratom products in the mail. Like they got products from different vendors in the mail, tested them, and did not find... um, significant amounts of 7-hydroxymitragynine. This is really crazy for me because I hadn't heard of this before. He says that 7-hydroxymitragynine does not occur in kratom leaves naturally, you know, or at least while they're still in the ground. When you pick them, it ends up going through this like post-mortem oxidate process, I think is what he called it. (laughs) And and through this process, mitragynine starts being converted into 7-hydroxymitragynine. The other way it's converted is when you consume kratom. And in your liver and intestine, it is converted into 7-hydroxymitragynine. 
So when he was testing the products that he had ordered in the mail, he started thinking about it and realizing that maybe there hadn't been enough time that had passed since those kratom leaves had been picked to when the product was arriving at his doorstep for that oxidate post-mortem oxidate process or whatever it was called to take place and he attributed this potentially to the fact that the markets for kratom move so quickly that there hadn't been enough time for that process to take place which i thought was just really neat and an interesting observation like depending on how long it takes for your kratom to get to you it might consist of a different alkaloid profile isn't that interesting wow so this is bringing us to the, the, the thing I want to talk about today. What I realized today when I was thinking about that fact was, holy smokes, if a lot of Kratom products that are in the mail don't consist of 7-hydroxymetragynine and that the ones that do, you know, it's typical that a Kratom Consumer Protection Act or anyone who wants regulation would say you don't want more than 2% of the total alkaloid profile to be 7-hydroxymetragynine, right? Well, if it's 2%, if that's the limit, that's only talking about 7-hydroxymetragynine in the plant before you consume it. Once you consume it, you're converting metragynine into that alkaloid. So you're making more in your body and We also know from his research and from elsewhere that that alkaloid, 7-hydroxymetragynine, is not the same as mitragynine. It it is more powerful, and from the limited research I've seen that shows any sort of potential for respiratory depression, I think that, from what I recall, it's, it's more likely that any respiratory depression is coming from that alkaloid than from mitragynine. Like, there was this study, and I cannot remember where it was from, so I apologize, but there was a study fairly recently, probably like two years ago maybe, or three tops, and they were looking at how mice reacted to ridiculous concentrations of like mitragynine, 7-hydroxymitragynine, kratom tea, kratom plant matter in and of itself, you know, something like that. And the only time that they saw any significant evidence of respiratory depression whatsoever I believe came from when they were giving mice pure extract form of 7-hydroxymetragynine and so you know pure like nothing else so what it's making me think is that you know if there's any sort of concern or danger with kratom that would be the first place I would look and the fact that the kratom consumer protection act framework says no more than two percent should be found in any kratom product being sold isn't taking into account what's being made in your body once you take it so i'm wondering if we should start looking at that aspect of this too maybe i'm behind the curb here too like i mean this is just average old me here you know as i learn about kratom maybe this is already in the works i don't know but i just thought i'd make the point that wow 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 all the kcpas out there kratom consumer protection acts all of the language in uh, these different government websites, all these language, uh, or sorry, all these, you know, um, facts that are stated about Kratom on state websites, on proponent and opponent websites. All of them are wrong for the most part because they all say that that second alkaloid is naturally occurring in the plant. And I think, you know, I guess you can make the argument that it does naturally occur once the plant is not living anymore and that it's the oxidized process that takes place afterwards based on specific drying settings or ingestion but that that so it seems like a stretch to me so really what i'm trying to say here is i think that things should be updated like now i think that we should update the language for starters everywhere to say that mitragynine is naturally occurring in kratom plants and leaves and that 7-hydroxymitragynine is what that first alkaloid is converted into through specific drying settings after being picked and or consumption (laughs) 
in the liver and intestine. So that is like different than what everybody is saying right now. And I think that it's important because if we're talking about the safety of people, if we want to actually know the truth about whether Kratom is dangerous or not, as we learn more about the makeup of Kratom and how it interacts with our bodies, and I mean, geez louise, you know, the air we breathe, the wind as it dries, if we're putting it in a heater and, you know, we're blasting it at 200 versus 150 versus 170 degrees versus 130 degrees, how does that affect the 2%? thing like okay you're making two percent well does that mean that it's not going to be converted in the body i don't think so i think you're going to make more in your body and what does that mean so essentially people are ending up you know being exposed to more than that two percent level it's just part of that process is taking place inside your body part of it's taking place outside and we're only looking at the outside part right now so that's kind of what i've been thinking about lately And I don't know how much water this holds, you know, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I'm not a scientist, but I do think that it's worth mentioning and we should all be pretty accurate with how we talk about it. And also, of course, in legislation and on websites, specifically government ones (laughs) and those that advocate for Kratom. Everybody should be updating their websites with with information that's current. This is all just coming from that one thing that Dr. McCurdy said in this presentation. So I can't imagine all the other thoughts and, and, uh, you know, potential changes that should take place out there resulting from new research from Kratom. That's precisely the point. This is exactly why there needs to be more research so that people like me can stumble their way through figuring out the language to make policies and, (laughs) and to figure out what they think about it and if it's dangerous or not. Uh, and if there are helpful benefits or not. So anyway, those are my thoughts. I will leave it there. Thanks for dealing with my ramblings, uh, you know, as I make my way through scientific language that I am certainly not equipped mentally to handle, let alone to talk about (laughs) to other people. But um, you all rock and you've been very supportive. So thank you. And we will be back tomorrow. Take it easy, everybody. Bye bye.